I have a, uh, the very rare opportunity of introducing to you this afternoon the people who put together the documentation activity supporting Red Bull Stratos, uh, which was a record-shattering event that took place last October the 14th last year. Um, first, I'd like to check with the audience. I'd like to see how many of you have had your life spared by a parachute. And I tried to frame it in, in a way that allows for unfortunate fighter pilots whose plane gets shot down, base jumpers, people jumping off buildings, uh, antenna, spans, cliffs, and skydivers, and maybe wingmen, which is the latest extreme sport. I have a show of hands of people who've had their lives spared by a parachute, skydivers. That's great. Um, now I'd like to have a show of hands of, of those of you who would like to bunny hop off a platform at 128,000 feet above the Earth's surface, free fall for about four minutes, open your canopy, glide down, and make a stand-up landing. How many would like to do that? Well, that's, that's wonderful because the people I'm going to introduce this afternoon recorded all of this with a mantra that goes something like this. If you don't have a picture, it never happened. Uh, this was quite a challenge. The project uh, took, as Phil mentioned, about four and a half years. So I'm going to introduce the two people who were responsible for the recording and the challenges they had to meet. There was a requirement four and a half years ago, actually a little longer than that, by the uh, Red Bull Corporation to find a small group of people, a team of people, who had experience in recording high-speed events, high-altitude, zero-g, zero-gravity environments, but getting documentation, irrefutable documentation, of high quality. And uh, next slide, if we can go to the next slide here. It's, let's see. Okay. Oh, I got it. Okay, we moved over to the next one. Here we go. Thank you. Okay, the, um, I've listed the major technical requirements. Um, there are in-flight cameras, but there are two types. There are the capsule cameras and the pressure suit cameras. There's ground cameras, and you've seen the J Lair truck, I believe, in the exhibit area today. If you haven't, please stop by. There were two of these. Uh, J Layer stands for Large Aperture Infrared System. There's the tracking helicopter, and then there's the communication system followed by a video data transmission distribution system. So all this had to be accomplished, and actually was accomplished in about six months at a cost for the first truck of $350,000. That in itself, I believe, is a record. <laughs> I took a quote out of the, out of the um, site that said, the challenge is providing extensive still video images in the extremes of the stratosphere have proven as complex as every other mission component. Uh, Balloon-borne capsules, telescopes into that environment is a horrendous challenge. There's another way of representing this requirement, and that's in the next slide. A typical national range tracking site looks like the image on your left there. That's Anderson Peak. Uh, Anderson Peak is located on the California coast in the Big Sur forest up just south of Carmel. You see there a 36-inch tracking telescope. You see a control area, uh, antenna, television antenna. Um, that entire operation had to be integrated and packaged and operable in six months on the back of a truck. So I think this is the best example of, I have of what the requirement really boiled down to. The next slide.
There were a few things that came into the picture as part of the operational scenario. Uh, number one, it was anticipated that the uh, object, man-sized object, might be as far as 35 miles slant range. Now, the people involved in this, the, the two presenters later following me, uh, have a lot of experience with taking objects from a launch pad into space. Um, I like to use the term reverse engineering. We're taking an object in space and bringing it back to launch pad. So it's pretty much the same technology, but we have the addition of the wind conditions, which drive the balloon around. And over Roswell, New Mexico, there were hundreds of possible sites on which we could get a good look. Number one reason for mobility. But remember, these sites had to be moved quickly and adjusted for wind conditions. The last item you've seen in the J layer, it really is a fully integrated range system, mobile range system. So in introducing the presenters, the, two, the next two presenters, uh, Dennis Fisher will follow me. And Dennis has range experience starting with uh, his photography as a combat photographer in Nam, through his uh, experiences still in cinematographer and the US National Ranges, Vandenberg Air Force Base for a number of years. But he's been involved in a number of commercial uh, activities, which are significant and play into Red Bull, Top Gun, Apollo 13, and Firebirds. And then he has the management and technical skills which come from managing the Western Range for a number of years. He was chairman of the Optical Systems Group, the Range Commanders Council. He formed the Long Range Optics Committee and he founded Genesis Applied Imaging on retirement from Vandenberg. Jay Nemeth, the second speaker, founder of Flightline Films, has a background as an aerial cinematographer, very comfortable in zero-G environments. He's done uh, traditional films, a number of commercial projects, the Buzz Aldrin Zero-G project, the F-22 unveiling, Thunderbirds, Thunder over Reno, and you can see a lot of his work on YouTube. He founded Flightlight Films to do this type of activity because there's a need for mobile tracking systems, and this fully fills that requirement. So it's with a great deal of pleasure that I introduce our first presenter, this afternoon to give you the story behind the documentation, the optical story behind the scenes, and that's Dennis Fisher. Okay, thanks, Joe. Thank you very much, Joe, for that introduction. Uh, I'm gonna start off uh, with a little video that gives an overview of the project to kind of give you a feel for what we're going to be talking about. If in fact, this thing works here. Let's see. Okay. Whoop. Jay, are you playing the video from back there? Okay. There we go. We got to get Helix off the ground safely and not tear the balloon. And uh, we need optimum conditions. So as the weather person here, we're going to be very, very, very picky right position. Felix has uh, completed his physical. Uh, I've been working four years on the program. I believe in what Felix tried to do, uh, to test the next generation full pressure suit. And I'm just delighted to be a member of the team. This is mission control at this time. Felix is departing on his interstate trailer to be strapped into the Stratos Council. I 
will assess the situation again. We will not start inflating as soon as the balloon is completed laying out. Copy so there'll, there'll be another small hold. T minus one hour, 13 minutes. We're going to go on hold. Chuck Yeager was the first man to go supersonic in an aircraft. It was 65 years ago, and I think it would be just absolutely wonderful if we could get Felix to go supersonic without an aircraft on the same day that uh, Chuck Yeager flew supersonic in an airplane. At this time, we have begun balloon inflation. Capsule systems are green, instrumentation's green, payload's green, medical systems are green. continuing as the team considers what are the options. So the decision has been made that Baumgartner will jump. When you're standing out there on that step, on top of the world, you know, you become so humble. At that moment, it's not about breaking records anymore. Well, that, I hope, gives you a little flavor of the, the excitement of the project. I mean, I was really... Uh, grateful to be a part of this. It was truly a, an exciting project and at times it seemed to drag on forever, uh, but by golly, uh, in the end, it, it just turned out fantastic. But there's, there's a lot that happened between the, uh, the first time when we came down here to the SPIE in 2009 looking for some technical solutions and uh, October of 2014 uh, when Felix jumped. And this, this uh, Butler building you see here is kind of emblematic of it. Uh, when we were out doing the site surveys trying to figure out where to, where to launch this mission from, this was what was at the Roswell Airport in the area that they, they recommended that we use for the mission. And uh, almost three years later to the day, we had built it into a first-class mission control system and really made history from that site. As part of the advanced team, we went around checking out uh, possible 
launch sites and also sites in the field where we would put our tracking mounts and uh, communications towers to put up microwave relays. It was uh, quite an extensive project. And you can see this, this is a Google Earth uh, photo here of the Roswell Airport. And uh, you can see where mission control was on the left. It was uh, in a remote area of the airport. And even though you see a lot of uh, airplanes parked around there, they're mostly just there for storage. It's not a very active airport. There's only a few flights a day in and out of there. So it worked out. Uh, and we had restricted access uh, to the base to protect our, our work that was going on there. So it, it was a very good location. And uh, <clears throat> this will give you an idea of what the capsule actually looked like. And the, in the view on the, the left, where it has Red Bull on the capsule, you see at the bottom it says Felix Baumgartner and it has that yellow black stripe there. Everything below that yellow and black stripe was actually a crush pad. It was a sacrificial part of the capsule that was actually uh, thrown away after each mission because we used the same capsule over and over again. And there were actually five missions flown, uh, two unmanned tests uh, to test all the flight hardware and systems, and then three manned flights. The uh, picture on the, on the right, you can see the front of the capsule where Felix's uh, egress door was there. And the next one, and here's a shot of the interior. It, it wasn't, uh, there wasn't a lot of room in there, but I think it had to be that way because everything had to be within arm's reach of, uh, of Felix while he was in there. Around the base of the capsule were life support systems, batteries. You can see some of the doers here for the oxygen, uh, for the breathing gases. And uh, there was just no spare space. Uh, but of course, our, our mission on this was the, was, or at least my involvement in this primarily, was with the long range optics. And Red Bull, their, one of their first uh, assignments was to find out what is exactly out there that we could use for this mission. And I first looked at their in-house capability, which, uh, other than just some long, uh, long lenses that they had for sports photography, they didn't really have much of a capability there. Uh, we looked at uh, test range assets, possible rental equipment, and our last uh, thing was to build something ourselves. Uh, here's some examples of what was available on the test ranges out there. On the left, that dual telescope is called a DOMES, a Distant Object Attitude Measurement System. It's dual 24-inch aperture telescopes. Uh, down at the very bottom center is a Contravi's uh, KTM tracking mount. And over on the right is a, is a J, uh, excuse me, um, uh, an MLAIR telescope from Vandenberg. And it has two 24-inch aperture telescopes on it. All these were good, but... Uh, we also considered the possibility of, excuse me, of uh, airborne assets. Uh, up in the top, you see the Cast Glance aircraft, which is a P-3 Orion, which has been outfitted with special camera systems for tracking missile launches. And below is the Wave aircraft, which was developed. It's an RB-57 that was developed for the shuttle return to flight after the, the last accident. Uh, for rental equipment, we did find one Cine Sextant from Photosonics down in Burbank available. Uh, and you can see that instrument here outfitted with some uh, Jonel telescopes and film cameras. But after we looked at all this and looked at the price and looked at the fact that the government test ranges couldn't actually guarantee availability, I mean, they may have actual government missions they had to support, and with Red Bull's mission being so weather dependent, we never knew when, when we would need the systems and for how long, so um, we ended up going with the Build It Ourselves uh, program. And we were able to acquire and repurpose two uh, MOTS tracking mounts, mobile optical tracking systems from uh, the Cape that had been uh, taken out of service on the shuttle program, and those were available. We were able to pick those up, uh, as well as a satellite uplink truck, and some COTS telescopes and COTS cameras. And in order to meet our six-month operational deadline, we didn't really have a whole lot of choice. We just didn't have the time to build something from scratch. 
Uh, for the concept of operation, this system definitely needed to be self-contained and, and mobile. And the roads, as we found out down in New Mexico, the county roads down there aren't like the county roads here in California, which are mostly two-lane paved roads. Down there, they were single-lane dirt roads. So it was really a hard environment to take these, uh, to take these instruments down. Uh, they had to operate under all the, <clears throat> all the weather conditions that we could do the mission under. And uh, we had to be able to maintain them when we were deployed. And uh, no single point of failure. We couldn't afford not to, lose, or not to have pictures of, the, of Felix and of the balloon at all times. So initially, uh, we started running some numbers on this to see what, uh, what sensor systems or what telescopes would, would work well together that we could get just off the shelf. And although that's not it's pretty straightforward calculations. Uh, we didn't have a good way of figuring in the r naught and what effect the atmosphere was going to have on these pictures under typical, under typical New Mexico weather conditions. So we, I contacted uh, Randy DeWeese from DeWeese Optical up in Ridgecrest, and he did some simulations showing, uh, and this is in uh, waves peak to valley up and, si up and down the left side there. And the distortions you can see are the geometric uh, diffraction and point spread function across the top. And he gave us for some typical environments that we might encounter in that part of the world based on the meteorological data that was available from White Sands. And this image you actually see, this is a frame grab on the left there that shows what we actually came out with. So his, his estimations were, were fairly good. In the meantime, uh, we we're starting to build the, the tracking mounts. This is one of the J-Layer trailers here, the trailer mounted version. The one you see downstairs is the one we built into a, into a truck. And, uh, but the other one is in this configuration you see here. Uh, here we are down in, uh, in California working on building up the system. We've removed the pedestal in this picture from the trailer and we're getting ready to hoist it up onto the truck and uh, get the system hooked up and configured. Here's the JLAIR 2 system uh, mounted with its instruments. This is out in the field and the control truck next to it there. And here's both of the systems kind of sitting side by side when we were doing some initial tests uh, for Man Flight 3, and it just seemed that these uh, systems required a lot of attention because we were, uh, they were getting a lot of rough usage, driving them up and down uh, the back roads in New Mexico, plus they, they're based in Las Vegas and had to be brought down to Roswell for each mission. This is typically, this is to give you an idea how we typically had the mount set up. Uh, you can see up on the top of that 40-foot air mast, uh, we had our meteorological instruments. We were tasked to provide wind direction, speed, and temperature, and just general uh, seeing conditions back to mission control on a half-hourly basis. Uh, also, our voice communication antennas were up there. We had a VSAT antenna, which uh, allowed us to uplink video directly to the internet. and. Uh, provide this uh, through a protected, password protected uh, URL to the medical team and to other teams in the field that needed to know in real time what was going on with Felix. Uh, and you can see there's the, the pedestal with the telescopes on it, our generator, and here's a, an example of, the, uh, of the, the medical field team, what they had to use out in, uh, out in the field. They could actually see Felix in flight they had to be prepared at all times, and they wanted to know how he was doing just in case they had to respond quickly to, uh, uh, to an accident. This is how the pedestal was configured for the mission. It's how we have it set up downstairs for you to uh, take a look at. The missions we first started out covering were some uh, test jumps Felix was doing from 25 to 28,000 foot altitude. We also had a, 
uh, skydiver who his name was Luke Akins, and he jumped with Felix on each one of his jumps, and he provided air-to-air -air photography uh, for later analysis and critique after uh, after each one of Felix's missions. As everything was finally getting put together and it, all the subsystems had been tested locally, it was time to test the whole thing as a as an integrated system. And we took it down to Brooks, what used to be Brooks Air Force Base, it's now uh, Brooks City Base. And Wiley Labs has a testing facility there uh, that would accommodate the whole capsule, although we did have to kind of take the top of it off to get it to fit in there. Uh, but all the instrumentation, everything went in there, including Felix, who we put in, who was put in the capsule and uh, ran a simulated mission all the way up to altitude. Uh, Felix uh, uh, was a part of this all the time. He was always out. You can see here he was out checking out the capsule and talking with the crew, and uh, he became a, um, an integral part of the thing because uh, he just wasn't some um, prima donna, you know, off on the sidelines somewhere. His life depended on, on all these technicians, and, and he knew it, and he worked very well with the crew. To give you an idea of the size of these balloons, um, you can just read the, uh, read the text there, but you can see the, the large balloon on the left is the one that was used for the record jump, and that's a nearly 30 million cubic foot balloon, approximately 40 acres of, of 8 mil plastic. Uh, The picture on the left of the capsule on the crane with the, it looks like a bomb hanging on it. Uh, we affectionately called it a bomb gartner. That was the, uh, a, test, a test vehicle that had all of Felix's instrumentation in it. And we did two unmanned flights uh, to take that up to altitude and drop it. Number one, to make sure we could track it. And number two, to make sure that the, uh, uh, all the instrumentation was working properly. These, uh, <clears throat> this is a shot of us getting set up for one of the unmanned balloon flights. Just bear in mind, um, we didn't have the luxury of setting these things up in the daytime where you could actually see what you're doing. The, all the telescopes, everything had to be stripped off the mounts and packed in protective cases, hauled out to the field, and then reassembled in the dark out there. And uh, some of the early flights, like in December, it was like 14 degrees. I mean, it was just lousy weather. We had everything from 14 degrees from some of the winter tests there to over 100 degrees in the summer. Here's a couple shots from unmanned flight two. And th this flight, uh, I didn't mention uh, the first manned flight, but it was, it was successful, uh, no problems. But manned flight two, they had a, a slight problem with the with the capsule recovery. Felix's portion of the mission went fine. And uh, when it came time to recover the, the balloon or the capsule, the way this was done, the way it's done is after Felix is safely on the ground, they would send a command up that would actually cut the, the balloon away from the, uh, the capsule. And the parachute is already deployed, although it's reefed. And um, it would fall from whatever altitude it happened to be at, down to around 20,000 feet where the parachute would fully deploy. In this case, the parachute did not fully deploy, and it suffered something even worse than a hard landing. This was a really hard landing. And you can see, um, you can see our uh, parts of our camera housings there and various things. Although it looks pretty bad, uh, everything survived pretty well once all the stuff was gathered up. But it still put us in a situation where uh, this whole capsule had to now be like remanufactured, retested, recertified, and prepared for the final for the final flight. And uh, that's what was done. And several months later, um, we were back in Roswell again. And our first attempt on uh, man balloon flight three did not go well. The balloon was inflated. Everything was looking good. And a dust devil 
came across the airfield, grabbed the balloon, twisted it up like a corkscrew, and trust me, uh, eight, eight mil thick plastic being rubbed against uh, rocks and cactus and stuff doesn't do well. So that scrubbed that mission. There were only three of these balloons in existence at the time. Uh, <clears throat> Red Bull had two of them. Uh, NASA had the third one, and NASA wasn't giving theirs up, so that meant we only had two. And now one of them was lost on our very first attempt, so we only had one balloon left. And this side, location, 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 trying to pick out where to put the tracking mounts to get the absolute best view uh, was always a, well, it wasn't a crapshoot. We had a very good weatherman who you saw in the beginning of the video, Dawn Day. And in this case, you can see at the top of the, uh, the top of the, slide, there's a green flight path. That's the predicted flight path. The white part of the line is what they call float altitude, when the balloon gets as high as it's going to go and it just is kind of drifting along. And Felix could jump at any point from there. The red, the red line is the descent of the capsule and where its ultimate predicted landing point will be. So that top, that top trace is what was expected to be the flight path. We went out and did all this setup. We're ready to go, and at 3 o'clock in the morning, they sent up another weather balloon, and Don says, I got bad news. Uh, and he emailed me this, and Jay called and said, we're going to have to move one of the trackers down to this new position. So I, I know these guys didn't want to hear this, but uh, we asked them to pack up, which they did uh, without hesitation, and took took their mount down the J-Layer 2 and set it up in a new position to be ready to support that lower red line, which was the new predicted flight path. But of course, things didn't, things didn't quite go as predicted, and the capsule ended up basically taking the path that was originally predicted, and uh, the site marked there as Felix's landing site on the top of the frame is where he actually landed which was just about a mile or so in from the edge of uh, Comanche Ridge, or excuse me, uh, Mescalero Ridge. Here was the uh, man, or the, for man balloon flight three, the part of the balloon inflation. You can see our camera housings there on the outrigger arms from the capsule. And this is the actual launch and the release. Now there is, and I should mention, there is kind of a, I'm not sure what they officially called it. We called it the death zone. When Felix lifts off in that capsule, he has to reach a certain altitude um, so that if they have to cut him away, if they have to cut the capsule away, it's up high enough that the parachute will have time to deploy and get him back safely on the ground. And that's something on the order of, I think, uh, three or 4,000 feet he had to reach before that could happen. So everybody, even though they were cheering when the balloon took off, everybody's always a little nervous waiting till he gets up through that first uh, three to 5,000 feet. And another thing I'd like to show you here in this picture of the, uh, the, the J-Lair, you see underneath the telescopes, there's two, two uh, antennas under there. One, another thing we were tasked to do, this was a, a problem that came up on one of the early test flights, is if the, if the balloon carried the capsule too far downrange, the onboard communications couldn't reach back to mission control. So they put these antennas on our tracking mount, knowing that we would always be pointed at the capsule or at Felix, and this allowed us to actually receive his voice communications and then relay it via microwave back to mission control. And as it turned out on the final mission, when you heard them discussing that he had a problem with his faceplate, uh, in order to, to confirm what the problem was, he had to actually disconnect his umbilical from, uh, from the capsule, which included his calm and his, and his air. And so when he disconnected, there was no break in communications. Uh, this, this link worked really well, and it was a, I don't know that it was a lifesaver, but it was sure a comfort to know that we could still talk with him. Here's a, here's a shot looking up. You can see above the, uh, above the air mast on the right-hand side a little white dot up there. That is the actual balloon. 
These things were visible to the naked eye, but with the clear desert air, it was always, it, it looked like an illusion almost. You could look up there, it looked like maybe a child's balloon from a party or something. It looked like it was only a few hundred feet away floating across the sky. But in fact, of course, it was, it was very high. In this case, which was, uh, this was on our, one of our unmanned flights, I think it was unmanned flight two, the wind carried this, the upper atmospheric winds carried this capsule all the way over into Texas. And then as it ascended even farther, the winds brought it back into New Mexico and it landed very close to where our, our tracking mount was. This uh, gives you a nice shot of the mission control and the displays and how our videos were used to keep the mission uh, people and their awareness of what was going on up to date. That's Joe Kittinger on the right. Joe was the current, holder record, current record holder up until Felix broke uh, most of his records. And uh, he was really the, the key advisor on this project. He's the only person that had ever done this before and had the experience. Another example of uh, the videos in Mission Control. And of course, finally, Felix, uh, Felix jumped and you saw the video of that. And once the parachute de was deployed, everybody uh, heaved a big sigh of relief, but it wasn't over because we had to go up and now and track the capsule down uh, for recovery of that. Uh, this was our crew, and this is not, certainly not done by one person or no, even two. Uh, we had two tracking mounts. We had a total of 16 people uh, on our whole uh, audiovisual crew. And after it was over, the recovery team went out. They removed that crush pad from the bottom of the capsule and hoisted it up on a truck. Uh, the balloon, you can see, it was in a relatively small box, about eight feet by four by four, when it was all vacuum packed. But uh, once it had been inflated, it, uh, there was no putting the genie back in the bottle. The uh, capsule, I'm not sure if it's still there. It was uh, a couple months ago, it was sent down to Houston where it was on display in the visitor center down there. And here are some of the, um, some of the facts and figures about the actual mission. I'll just put those up and you can take a look through them. Uh, it was quite impressive to think that, uh, uh, that Felix could go almost 800 and 44 miles an hour. And as uh, Joe mentioned in the video, he broke the speed of sound on the same day that Chuck Yeager broke the speed of sound, except Chuck Yeager, of course, was in an airplane. Uh, Felix wasn't. These are the, the records that have been validated. The most simultaneous YouTube views at it, 9 million plus. Uh, I don't know if that's one that the FAI cares about or any of the other international bodies, but Red Bull certainly was uh, elated. And here's some of the details on the capsule. You can see it, ex it certainly experienced some extremes of temperature. And it was amazing how fast the wind could actually carry it. Okay, does, uh, I'll take a few quick questions and then I'll bring Jay up here. If anybody has a question about the tracking portion of it. Okay. We're gonna be able to document now. the whole experience for the world to see going up, standing up and jumping and then free falling. It's going, to be a, it's going to be a very wonderful experience for the world to share the Felix experience as he free falls. There are over 35 cameras used in the Red Bull Stratus mission, and they are designed to establish visual contact with Felix Baumgartner, document the mission's progress in real time and for future review, and broadcast images to a global audience. The original camera plan was very simplified, and it was very much just like simple documentation. Um, you know, get the footage of Felix jumping for archival purposes, and then that evolved into, well, we really do need the live downlink to have 
awareness and mission control and also to support the broadcast because there will be uh, you know, millions of people watching this live. The challenges of providing extensive, still, and moving image coverage in the extremes of the stratosphere have proven as complex as every other mission component. We approach that two ways. One is we modify some of the cameras to operate in space. Uh, the other way is some of the cameras are so complex or require cooling fans that they actually go inside a pressurized enclosure that's filled with nitrogen gas. We've had to modify these so that they were uh, uh, remote controllable so that from mission control we could start and stop these recorders. The Red Bull Stratus camera configuration is unique. There are three aerial camera systems. At first, the cameras on the capsule. Secondly, the cameras on the pressure suit. And thirdly, the tracking helicopter with Cineflex. Some of the capsule cameras may be covered in ice upon touchdown, and Felix's suit cameras must function in stratospheric conditions. It's very important for everyone in mission control to know the state of every aspect of the mission. So it's not only Felix's condition, but the condition of the balloon, um, the envelope, the flight train, and the capsule. So we have a certain sequence of cameras that we run through depending on what point we are in the flight that can maximize this and give all the different departments in mission control the uh, optical data that they need to assess uh, whether we're good to go. Mission control there. Especially for Joe Hittinger, who is uh, the person who talks to Felix all the time. It's very important for him to see Felix. And um, so we have one downlink channel that's actually just dedicated for Felix's face. So Joe can tell how he's feeling. I think that helps a lot so we can actually see the athlete in the capsule and not just the uh, audio, but also video and see, see his face and how he's reacting on things. The capsule's nine advanced HD cameras are routed to one of the three digital video transmitters for live viewing on Earth. Forward. Special filters are used on some of the Red Bull Stratus cameras because the brightness of the sun is more intense in the upper stratosphere. It's basically a whole broadcast studio. It's one of the biggest parts that we provide a custom-made telemetry system for, for all those cameras. And that we are actually able to select different sources and put it on those three downlink channels and that we are able to remote control the recorders and uh, the cameras itself, that you can color match them down from ground control. We can even uh, uh, turn on and off his light and his capsule, which might even be a way to communicate to him. To achieve a live broadcast from 23 miles above the Earth, an optical ground tracking camera system was developed along with several features, from infrared to high definition cameras. This system is called the Joint Launch Vehicle and Aircraft Imaging in Real Time, j -Lair. It carries a variety of high power zoom lenses and large telescopes. The j -Lair control room allows technicians to select the best images available and transmit them in real time to mission control and or broadcast viewers. One of the things that we hear a lot as we've been doing testing of, uh, of these systems and doing launches is, wow, I've never seen that before. So that, it's kind of a good feeling to know that we're doing uh, some revolutionary imaging and that uh, people uh, who work in this business all the time um, are seeing things that they've never seen before. Hello, I'm Jay Nemeth, the uh, Red Bull Stratos Director of Photography, and uh, thanks for everybody coming out, and I uh, really want to thank Dennis for all his hard work in developing uh, the j -Lairs. He has over 30 years of experience on the Western Test Range in optics, as Joe mentioned, but uh, without him, we just, we couldn't have pulled off the uh, enormous uh, accomplishment of putting a system like this together in six months. I'm going to talk a little bit about the other uh, imaging systems that were used beyond the uh, tracking systems. Everything was driven by uh, uh, the mission objectives, basically, which were that we would have to have this situational awareness for the flight controllers, support this broadcast, which was really you know, one of Red Bull's uh, primary concerns. And then, of course, uh, there was other outlets, such as print media, possible IMAX documentary, 
and the BBC documentary. And as Dennis mentioned, the first responders in the field needed to see what was going on. Uh, mission control's requirements were, you know, pretty much the same as anybody would want. Let's see the highest quality images and, you know, know the condition of all this equipment and, and of Felix. Um, uh, the pilot's requirements were, since he was sitting inside the capsule, even though he had a great um, clear uh, door in front of him, so much heat came in that by the time we did these final two flights, he put a shade in that uh, window and couldn't see out. So um, we needed to make sure that he had situational awareness of what was going on. Broadcast, same thing, the highest quality and multiple angles. My background is uh, in television and filmmaking, so while we wanted to meet all the technical requirements, we also wanted to meet the storytelling requirements. We wanted the viewers to be able to have that experience of feeling like they were up there uh, with Felix. Um, still image requirements. Uh, BBC needed a little bit more than the broadcast because they were doing a long form feature film. So we wanted a little bit better than HD quality and some high speed uh, cameras that we could use later for slow motion. Uh, the medical team uh, requirements, we weren't really thinking about this capability at first, but uh, when we found out that they had uh, kind of positioned their response based on, is he going to have an embolism? Uh, could he be unconscious? Did the chute not deploy? You know, uh, is he going to have a broken leg? For them to know what was going on as quickly as possible, it's like the saying, a picture is worth a thousand words. You could send telemetry and people could call on walkie-talkies, but there's just too much confusion in that. So it was, it was uh, important that we could give them that image in real time. And of course, uh, be able to support uh, possible IMAX films in the future with something uh, much higher quality than HD. So the technical requirements of meeting uh, all these objectives was obviously HD. We needed a digital cinematography camera because we weren't going to fly a film camera in these environments. Uh, we needed a light source in the capsule, and of course the ground-based long-range optics, as Dennis discussed. HD video was pretty straightforward. We wanted to use a progressive imager so that every frame included all of the picture information. Interlaced was not a possibility, uh, as only half the picture information is there in each frame. We needed a two-third inch sensor to get the wide field of view, and of course remote control of, um, of all of these systems. Digital cinema camera needed a minimum 4K resolution, and of course the remote start-stop capabilities. Digital still cameras were specified by Red Bull, 20 megapixel, and they needed to get those cards out right away um, so that the still images could go out to, um, I don't know, is UP and API, are they still around? I don't know who distributes still images anymore, but uh, whoever those distributors were. Suit cameras, same thing, uh, had to be progressive. They were obviously gonna record uh, in camera, uh, we had to be able to space qualify those easily so that they would work, and, uh, and the pilot had to be able to start and stop those. Capsule lighting had to match uh, daylight color temperature, had to be dimmable because these missions always started at night. We needed a low light source, kind of a task light, but in the daytime when the sun was coming in through the windows, we needed to be able to bring the brightness up so that we could fill in shadows. Um, the helicopter Cineflex system that you saw needed to be gyro stabilized so that uh, it could work out at the long end of the lens. Um, and then the ground based cameras, Dennis has already covered that. We needed um, short wave infrared, um, visible light just can't really image, you know, a, a, a light dot against a pale blue background. Um, and we needed to have enough reach that we could see Felix's attitude. And then there was a bunch of ancillary capabilities we needed, which was the remote control of equipment, able to shut power off in case the mission ran longer and batteries were beginning to get low. We needed to be able to conserve power and, um, and monitor the temperature of all of that. So the challenges in creating these space-rated camera systems is uh, temperature, pressure, possible condensation, the lighting at altitude, and then for this mission, um, we had specific weight and location uh, requirements and a way to distribute all these signals. Temperature challenges, uh, I'm not going to go into the detail on everything. Obviously, batteries don't last very long in the cold. 
Um, at that altitude, you're faced with things in the shade being very, very cold, but things on the sunny side are getting um, uh, radiation from the sun. They can get very hot, but you don't have any uh, atmosphere or very little atmosphere, not that many air molecules for, to use for convection. Um, pressure challenges were the lack of convective cooling, as I just said. Couldn't use hard drives because they malfunction in a vacuum. Outgassing of insulators and uh, board level component failure, electrolytic capacitors tend to fail in a vacuum. Um, and then the condensation challenges were the, um, uh, these things were going to get very cold up there and then when they came back down and, and came back into a, a humid environment, uh, there could be condensation on the optics. Uh, lighting challenges I already discussed. We needed low light uh, in the evening and bright light uh, in the daytime. And then uh, we had a large amount of equipment. They gave us a number, said do not exceed this weight because every, um, I believe it was every uh, pound that you added to the capsule decreased the altitude by 10 feet. So they wanted to go as high as possible, keep the weight as low. Um, so taking all of this, we had to come up with uh, the solutions. And, and my first idea was, well, th this is very challenging. Let's do Stratos the way they did the Apollo missions. I mean, it's already been done. We know how they did it. Uh, they did it in a studio and uh, faked it. So we'll just have Felix jump in a ball pit and um, you know, put him in front of a green screen and we can just do this all in CGI. And uh, nobody liked my idea. They said, no, you have to actually do it. So we came up with a camera plan of where the cameras would go. Um, Technically, you could put the cameras anywhere and probably the flight controllers would be happy with it. You could put the light anywhere and if you saw something, they would be happy with it. But we had a broadcast and a feature film to support. So we spent a lot of time, before the capsule was even uh, built, all there was was this chromoly frame. We would put people there and we would take pictures and we knew where the horizon would be and I knew where I wanted him in relation to the horizon to tell this epic story. And uh, we took pictures and we took accurate measurements of exactly where everything went to the inch, measured distances from the capsule, and then constructed the camera boom arms and all the equipment to support that. Uh, we had HD video cameras on the outside of the capsule, which uh, were a custom space rated unit. And even though inside the capsule it was normally pressurized, he did have to blow down before he opened the door. So those cameras had to work in a vacuum for a short amount of time. We ended up putting those HD cameras in small housings to reflect the uh, sun's radiation, keep them from overheating. And here's a shot of one of them inside the, uh, the housing. And then we had a small chamber that simulated the, um, the pressure and the temperatures. So all of this small equipment could be put inside this chamber. We could take it down to minus 70 degrees uh, Celsius and uh, and get to altitudes of 140,000 feet and run these things for hours to validate uh, that they would work. Digital cinema cameras were the large red one. They create a lot of heat. Um, they have fans uh, that move air. There was no way we could space rate one of those. So we came up with a design that um, used housings. And there's one over at the booth if you haven't seen it. Uh, these are filled with dry nitrogen gas and uh, we have a glycol heat exchanger which you can see on the top of the frame here um, which is like a small chiller unit circulates the cold glycol from uh, the capsule and uh, fan moves that takes the hot air out puts uh, and cools it um, i wanted to point out that unlike a lot of projects and maybe a lot of you have worked on government projects um, you take something like this, you figure out what it's going to cost, how many years it's going to take. You go to an engineer, they figure out how everything's going to fit um, and come up with engineering diagrams, CAD cams, and all that. We just didn't have time for all that. So basically, I grabbed all the cameras we needed. I got a cardboard tube and some plywood, and I figured out what the size was that would allow all of this stuff to fit in. And once I got it to work, I took my cardboard uh, science project to our, uh, our machine shop, MyCar, and they made the actual housings. I want to point out that MyCar has a long history of um, providing housings for the aerospace industry, 
uh, launch pad cameras, blast proof housings, and um, they actually have a legacy that goes back to Apollo. They manufactured some of the parts that went on the LEM uh, landing gear. So they were the perfect choice to, to manufacture these housings. Um, everything, because this was a, a man-rated project and there was somebody's life at, uh, on the line, everything would have to be triple tested as far as G, pressures. These housings operated at one atmosphere or roughly 16 PSI, 15 PSI. So everything was checked out to 45 PSI to make sure that there, nothing would fail or rupture, um, unlike a hydrostatic test, which is uh, how we tested and is pretty unremarkable and during the actual flight when these are pressurized with gas. A failure could be explosive and, and possibly damaging to the suit. Uh, the housings were placed on the ends of arms, again at the exact point that we had determined would be the uh, right angle. There was really no way to confirm that until the first flight, but everything turned out to be pretty much right on the money. And uh, they kind of pull focus from the capsule because there are these gangly, funny looking things, but uh, it was important to capture all the images. On the uh, pressure suit, uh, there was a lot going on, but uh, we were told that we could put a camera on the chest pack facing up, and we ultimately pushed for uh, two thigh-mounted cameras, one aiming up to see the release, and one aiming down towards either the earth when he was feet down, or when he was face down, we could see the uh, balloon. Um, we tested these with Luke Akins doing test jumps to validate the angles, and what focal length uh, we wanted to use. Ultimately, these cameras that we had, had picked, we weren't happy with for several reasons. And uh, we ended up going with a commercial off-the-shelf sports camera, a GoPro. This is what we used in the um, chest pack. We were able to fit two of these on each leg in that existing pouch. So we had two aiming down and two aiming up, good for redundancy, and also gave us both sides of the suit in case he was pulling emergency chutes. Uh, we made about three modifications to these to get them space rated so that they would operate in a vacuum and, and not have condensation issues. The chest pack, in addition to the camera, which is in the upper left, had his voice communications radio, a T-Slim telemetry uh, radio, also in the UHF band, an audio recorder, uh, accelerometers, IMUs, batteries, basically everything that's in your iPhone, but a lot larger. And we said, why didn't you just use an iPhone? And well, that wouldn't have quite worked, so. Uh, this is like a large iPhone, basically. LED light panel, we constructed a, a space-rated unit that would work in a vacuum without overheating and provide the light intensity that would fit in the top of the uh, pressure sphere. And this allowed us to have a very pleasing soft source rather than a pinpoint source with harsh shadows which you can see on the left, but it was also capable of extremely high intensities uh, during the middle of the mission. Um, the weight and location of the equipment was kind of the wild card as we were coming up with all this stuff. It's like, where is this stuff gonna go? And originally, they had told us that maybe we could have that area below the sphere uh, along the bottom deck, but as you can see, it's full of life support equipment and uh, the batteries. That whole area was full. So they said, well, you can have the attic which is this uh, small cylindrical portion above the sphere. And we were like, okay, so we have a lot of square equipment and you're asking us to put it in a kind of a round area. They provide us with some CAD diagrams. They said, this is what it looks like. Here's the dimensions, your maximum width and height. And from that, we came up with this, which we called the cage, which was a cylindrical unit that had to support uh, nine HD recorders, three video transmitters with power amplifiers, uh, routers, encoders, audio embedders, up converters, down converters, uh, 48 channels of uh, circuit breakers, and DC to DC converters. Basically everything in a 45 foot sports production truck that might cover a football game, we had to fit in a thing uh, roughly the size of a beer keg. And speaking of beer kegs, it sat down into a keg where we could seal it fill it with nitrogen because everything in there had fans. This system consumed about 80 amps of power for uh, up to five hours. So it generated a lot of heat, um, but uh, through the heat exchangers, we were able to cool it. This is a shot of the keg in the top of the capsule without the cage in it. And then um, 
we were trying to figure out how are we going to work on this thing. Uh, so we came up with uh, this uh, counterbalance gas spring idea that instead of needing a crane every time we wanted to work on it, uh, we could just loosen the bolts and it would come up out and then we could open the, um, open the panels to get to the equipment. So we started out, put all the equipment on a table, said this is what we need to cram into this tiny space, and it became pretty apparent we were going to have to go with a radial pattern for everything so that we could get to uh, all the recorders. Stacking them really wasn't an option. We took the 19-inch EIA rack mount units, stuck them in the middle, surrounded that with the HD recorders, and then hinged the panels like petals on a flower that would flip open so that we could get to things and work on it. And we were really happy with this clean design. It seemed like you could get your hands and arms in there very easily, but it soon turned into this. It had so much equipment packed into it, two and a half miles of wiring, ribbon cables, uh, GPIO relays, camera control units, and all kinds of stuff that just kind of evolved as the, as the mission got bigger. It, it literally, it, we couldn't fit another another sheet of paper in there. Uh, this is the lid up. You can see the heat exchangers that uh, take the heat out and put cool air in. Uh, view from the bottom, the three video transmitters are along the right, and then uh, a lot of the, the circuit breaker wiring underneath the router. And then we need an electrical system for this. Sage had developed a uh, space rated circuit breaker for the life support systems and the radios inside the capsule. So we figured, let's just go ahead and continue using those breakers. And so we came up with a, a section that went onto the bottom of that with a radial bus bar system that the circuit breakers plugged into, and below that, a radial system for the Vicor DC to DC converters, which maintained the correct power levels as the batteries discharged. And then that was assembled onto the bottom. You can see the bottom uh, carousel is the DC converters, and above that, the 48 breakers. Because Felix was the um, pilot in command, we needed to make sure that he was able to turn units off should there be a short circuit or a fire or something of that nature. Um, so the circuit breaker panel was divided into two. The lower left uh, set was capsule and life support breakers, and the upper right was uh, what they called payload, which was all of my camera systems. And we arranged it in rows, color-coded, and also a letter and number uh, column row system so that uh, for the breakers we couldn't control, if we needed Felix to power cycle something, he could easily get to it. So the primary control of um, those systems was through a telemetry system that Riedel Communications designed to our specification. This allowed us to turn those breakers on and off, turn on devices, put uh, recorders into record, stop them, adjust the aperture on the 4K cameras, adjust the shutter speed uh, on the HD cameras, and also uh, monitor temperatures inside the various devices. Everybody in Mission Control had a, a lab view um, display of all the critical um, devices on the capsule, so this would give us payload battery voltage, um, coolant temperature, all the things that I was concerned with I could see. And, and a lot of stuff I wasn't concerned with, but other people were. As far as Felix's situational awareness, the left-hand pod, we installed a 9-inch uh, HD monitor. And to the left of that, you can see under that green fluorescent display, there's a rotary knob. That knob steps through the nine camera positions. So Felix was able to look up at the balloon. He could look down at the Earth. He could look out at the horizon. And he could also look at the camera that was behind him looking over his shoulder. And this was valuable for him to check the condition of the bailout bottles and also that the tether that armed the Cypress, which was the barometric uh, firing parachute uh, backup, uh, had not, um, had in fact uh, disconnected the way it was supposed to, and also to make sure the parachute didn't premature, prematurely uh, eject into the capsule. If that was the case, that was considered a no-jump situation and abort, uh, he would have to ride the capsule back down. We brought all these images back to Mission Control. This is my station here in the third row uh, with all of the various monitors bringing back the cameras from the capsule, the J layers, and some of the capsules by the launch site. Um, we always kept that image of J uh, Felix in front of Joe Kittinger, Kittinger's uh, position. Um, even though they had voice comm, 
uh, Joe and our medical director, John Clark, felt it was important to see Felix's face. They could tell a lot more about his condition uh, by actually seeing him. This is a brief flow chart of um, how the camera systems came down. The um, nine HD cameras and the digital cinema cameras uh, went to a capsule router to the three video transmitters. These were transmitted down to the three uh, microwave receivers that went into my mission control router. Also brought the two J layers and the helicopter to that router. And then the uh, OB truck, which handled the broadcast, they had cameras by the launch site. So we brought those cameras into mission control and then conversely sent our cameras to them to be incorporated in the broadcast. And then I would take all of these sources and assign them to the various mission control monitors. Um, it was pretty busy. There was a lot going on in addition to routing all those uh, cameras in the correct sequence. We had to make sure the exposure and aperture shutter speeds were correct as, as the day went on. Uh, the monitor on my right shows all of the cameras from the capsule coming down. The monitor on the left is all of the launch pad cameras. And below that is the router that assigned those. So in the end of building all of this equipment, um, the various networks and magazines have said, you know, that these were some of the most iconic pictures of 2012. And uh, it's great to see non-industry people come up to me and say, you know, watching that broadcast, I, I really felt like I was there and experiencing it and my heart was racing. And I was like, that was really the goal was, you know, to give the flight controllers everything they wanted, but still bring home the emotion. And in fact, the uh, readers of Sports Illustrated voted this picture uh, the number one picture of the year in Sports Illustrated. And uh, I just want to point out uh, this picture in the lower left. We had a lot of cooperation from Red Bull Media House, Riedel Communications, 3G, hundreds of people worked on this. But this is the uh, core crew of uh, the 16 Flightline Films guys that manned the two J layers and the capsule cameras. If I can just point out, some of them are here today. Uh, my sons, Joe and Alex Nemeth, technicians, if you just stand up real quick. Chris Wessling, um, Joel Smith is here. Anybody else I leave out? Obviously, Dennis is here. And uh, one, of the great, one of the great things of, uh, of this mission for us is we were recently recognized with an Emmy Award for outstanding innovations in sports event coverage. And uh, the other uh, competitors in our uh, category were the Olympics and the Super Bowl. So uh, it was kind of a, a great pat on the back <laughs> to, uh, to beat them out. 